The history of Sakai is rather unusual. Chitose Abe, the founder and creative director, spent eight years working in her dream job as a pattern cutter for Rei Kawakubo's Comme des Garçons, but after she quit her job in 1995 to become a full-time mother, she craved something creative for herself and founded a small business known as Sakai. So how did the brand go from motherhood side hustle to one of the most coveted brands in the world? And how did she become the queen of collaborations for brands like Nike, Dior, and Apple? Sakai was founded in 1999 but the history starts a little before it was founded. Chitose Abe's husband is Junichi Abe. He was working with Chitose at Junior Watanabe until 1994, when he left to begin his own label with some friends called PPCM. You may not have heard of this label because it was disbanded in 2004, but it was her husband's newfound creative freedom, specifically the freedom to not show during a pre-distinguished fashion week, that inspired Chitose to begin her brand Sakai in 1999. This in turn inspired her husband Junichi Abe in 2004 to start another label, one that you're very much more likely to know, Colour. Though the husband and wife have yet to collaborate on anything, and neither have been to the other's fashion shows. So, Sakai was just truly a side hustle for Chitose Abe, who initially just set up the brand to have something to do in her free time. Purposely seasonless, and purposefully low maintenance, though a highly personal brand even the naming of which Sakai is a take on her maiden name, which is also pronounced Sakai, just with a K. Sakai began with just five pieces of knitwear and was certainly not meant to be a long-term investment, but she still wanted it taken seriously. She marched down to Beams, the still prolific Japanese department store with her five sample garments and tried them on personally in front of the buyers. At first, she knew nothing of business and didn't understand what they meant when the buyers asked her what the markup for the store was, but upon receiving the pieces to the store, the buzz was already starting. When the public first saw the garments in the store, buyers and customers alike would ask who was behind the brand, just to find a woman alone, making these incredible clothes just from her house. She spent the first three years making practical but interesting knitted garments from her home in Tokyo, slowly growing her brand. It took her three years to hire her first employee, Chika Hashimoto, who would help her produce garments now the brand had grown more in demand. Her brand was always successful, however, even from the first quote-unquote collection that was only a handful of garments. She had the personal seal of approval from Comme des Garçons, who were a fan of her work, so the fashion elite of Tokyo knew the brand and desired to own a piece for themselves, meaning the demand was high, the product was low, and the buzz was all over the city. So much so that buyers would ignore the conventions and fashion business and literally come to her house to place their orders while her daughter ran around. It was at this time that she developed and honed her design style, and even though she has said that it lacked innovation, it's the foundation for the design style that will come to define Sakai as a brand. Even at this early stage, she was so focused on creating the new that she didn't and still doesn't buy a fabric for her brand. She does and has always had the fabric produced specifically for each design. Her craving for the completely new was still unique in 1999 creating a niche within the market of aesthetic technical wear for herself, benefiting from the anti-fashion trend begun by the likes of Yoshi Yamamoto and her old boss Rei Kawakubo. Sakai was making products that no one knew that they wanted. By 2003, the brand was so successful that Chitose Abe decided to rent a formal office far outside of central Tokyo in Tokyo's Daikanyama district in which to house the business, which for the previous four years had only been run from her familial home. It's also at this time Chitose Abe forged the real Sakai brand DNA, which was the fusion of garments and or fabrics to create something truly new, whereas before it was much more focused on hand knitting. The process of combining garments to create something new has remained ever since then, and as the Washington Post puts it, Chitose begins by crafting a garment by ripping another one apart. This is something still true to the brand today, like as she said in 2018, just because it's a jacket doesn't mean it can't be something else. The 2005 collection is the first to be fully documented by the internet, and it was picked up by several international retailers, including at least three in Antwerp, and the pieces proved so commercially viable that in 2006, she was asked to supply a diffusion menswear line for Corso Como's Aoyama store that came to be named Sakai Gem, which was also so successful that it was picked up by Dover Street Market Ginza. In 2006, she began a diffusion line named Sakai Luck as a lingerie brand. Unfortunately, this era of Sakai Luck has been wiped from the internet, but Vogue likened it to Miu Miu's relationship to Prada. 
both made with the aim of having more freedom, more fun, but both women, Mrs. Prada and Mrs. Abbe, keen businesswomen. So make no mistake that everything remains incredibly commercially viable for their customers. In fact, Abbe has stated on many occasions that she designs for a business. She designs for herself and for her customers only what she knows will sell. So with clear talent for branding, retailing and marketing, the brand was growing faster really than Chitose Abbe could have expected, but she still purposely tried to keep the growth growing extremely slowly. That was until the wider fashion world outside of Tokyo started to take notice a few years later. In 2008, she produced her third show, an installation in Tokyo for Autumn Winter 2009. The show was a huge success, and so the brand was picked up by large retailers Barney's in New York and Colette in Paris. This really was the push the brand needed to convince them to work the company on a bigger scale. So, as many Japanese designers have done over the years, she moved to Paris, but was still resistant to showing on the Fashion Week schedule, something she relished in avoiding as the idea of not being bound to a Fashion Week schedule really was the catalyst to beginning her brand in the first place. So, she showed showroom installations instead. Her first in Paris was actually the launch of her menswear line in Autumn Winter 09, and it was her first to have living models, standing as per usual in a fashion installation, while the Sakai show in Spring Summer 2010 was their first with walking models, although still classified as an installation by the brand. However, due to her aversion to putting on a show, she retreated for Spring Summer 11 to present her collections in the more traditional showroom installation style, i.e. with stationary models. She was very careful with each and every decision she made for the brand, and wanted the clean white backdrop with a singular light source to frame the clothes perfectly. Something that was very clearly successful because it's easy to find the collection in full online on sites like Vogue Runway, which is something very rare for designers' early showings. But this speaks on how influential her brand was even before it had its first official catwalk collection. Despite her desire to remain discreet, her brand spoke to so many people. From the fresh perspective on women's wear and now men's wear, to the technicality of her fabrics made custom for Sakai, to the fusion of streetwear to high fashion. There really was something for everyone, and the brand was really popular with consumers. She was already being seen on celebrities like Rihanna in 2009 and again in 2010, and she was asked by Montclair to design an entire collection for their Montclair S line, which is the predecessor to Montclair Genius that we have now. From here, the brand just exploded. As well as opening her first flagship store in Tokyo in an old dilapidated restaurant that was gutted and redesigned by famous interior designer Sue Fujimoto in 2010, she decided it was time to start putting on actual fashion shows, something she knew she would never be able to turn back from. So, for Autumn Winter 2011, she put on her first production of a catwalk collection, which was so successful that she was considered to be the show of the season by some, thereby achieving 15 more international stockists instantly, as well as receiving flowers directly from Karl Lagerfeld, and by Autumn Winter 2012, she was already officially on the Paris Fashion Week schedule. Now with more eyes on the brand, in 2014, she collaborated with Clarks, a British shoe brand known primarily for making school shoes for children, and with Vans for a series of trainers, both of which were fairly popular at the time, though not really enough to create major waves. But it was in Spring Summer 15 that she began a partnership that would soon come to be one of the most sought after collaborations ever that being with Nike. The collection was aimed towards technical wear as streetwear for women, which was one of the first collaborations to do so ever. This collection composed of only eight pieces, seven of which clothing items, and was inspired by multiple sports like tennis, running, and American football. She brought her branding to the collection through dynamic silhouettes and the combination of Nike's infamously great technical fabrics like tech fleece, mesh, and lace to make women's wear pieces like the ones that you see in this film meant to promote the collection, shot by fashion film artist Ven Shah. It was also in this collection that they, Nike and Sakai, would release their first trainer together, a trio of slip-on laceless Air Max 90s that I don't think sold that well, only because they're the only shoe that I know of that have been made by Nike and Sakai that went on to have heavy discounts later on. Despite that, the collection actually did really well for a limited release that it ran for, selling in Sakai's usual stockists, Dover Street Market and Colette, while also in Nike Lab stores worldwide. Shortly after the first release period in March through June, another piece was added to the collection, the Sakai Dunk. Another laceless shoe based on the Dunk Luxe silhouette, which was released in the November of 2015. 
At the same time, the catwalks continued and would be a mainstay of her brand for women's wear, but men's wear continued to have installations until spring summer 16, after which they also would have catwalk collections, and she began installations for Sakai Lark, the diffusion line in 2014, which still lives on despite only having three presentations. She would then, in spring summer 17, launch her first handbag collection, which is always an important step for a brand because bags and shoes are always the biggest sellers for a company simply due to their desirability. And by this point, she already has a strong customer base with over 90 stores worldwide. So the bags themselves are a wonderful extension of her brand aesthetic, bringing forward the technicality in materials to bags with leather and suede and straw and leather. Really, Sakai has two main brand identifiers only, that being the technical combination of more than two textiles and a deconstructed aesthetic. For any brand to have so few brand identifiers is quite unusual, but the aesthetic is so successfully strong that a Sakai piece is easily recognizable, giving that if you know, you know element that has been key to the brand's success since the early days when the brand was spread by mouth by the fashion elite in Tokyo. If you were to put four random Sakai looks together, totally unrelated to their season, it may seem at first like they wouldn't be related, but the handwriting of the designs mixed with such a strong signifier allows any consumer to understand the understated luxury that is so difficult for a brand to achieve, and yet is absolutely perfected in Chitose Abe's vision. She continued to collaborate with major brands like Undercover for a documentary, Beats by Dr. Dre for their first ever customizable collaboration, and with her ongoing collaboration with the North Face, which also started in 2017, as well as a takeover of Colette in its final year of trading that saw Abe transform the top floor of the renowned retail space into a jungle. This was a huge deal at the time because the other design labels asked to do so were brands like Balenciaga, Saint Laurent, Tom Brown, and Chanel. But Sakai would hit new levels of fame in 2018 upon the release of their second Nike collaboration. Having a successful collaboration with a sports brand like Nike can really make smaller brands or more underground brands stick in the public eye, bringing them notoriety as well as consumer desirability, giving them a durability in the industry. But the second wave of Sakai Nike collaboration that was begun at this point in 2018 was new heights of success for either brand. The collaboration began with the announcement in the Spring Summer 19 show of a Nike Sakai shoe named Blazer with the Dunk that blended the Nike Blazer with the Nike SB Dunk. However, when it was officially released in full in 2019, the fashion and the streetwear worlds were both completely taken back. The collection was a full collection of clothing, with Naomi Osaka, who was at the height of her fame, being the face of the collection. The set featured all of the hallmarks of a Sakai collection, the merging of fabrics, the merging of garments, the feminine but dynamic silhouettes, and so the clothing was really successful. But it was with a simple shoe drop on May 16th, 2019, that the collaboration would take on a new life of its own. The Nike and Sakai LD waffles, which were made of a combination of the Nike waffle daybreak and the LDV fusion, were added to a plethora of best sneaker lists and were seen on a ridiculous amount of celebrities like Devin Brooke, LeBron James, Naomi Osaka, ASAP Rocky, Hailey Bieber, Little Uzi, and so, so, so many more. The shoe sold out instantly and was shortly added to with new colorways and a whole new shoe which was further developed on for a second series of clothes for fall winter 2020 that was revealed with this video called Sakai on Ice. The Sakai Nike 2019-2020 collaboration remains one of the most sought after brand collaborations in history and is known by sneakerheads as one of the best Nike collaboration designs ever with its iconic double swoosh referencing the two shoes that were merged together to make either of the two new Sakai shoes. With the major success of this collaboration, the pairing went on for three years, mostly with the LD waffles that saw an incredible amount of colorways in the end. Further down the line, yet another trainer was added to the collaborative pieces, that being the Vapor waffles in 2020. These were also incredibly sought after by sneakerheads and those in fashion, so much so that Sakai and Nike brought on a third collaborator to make a new three-way collaboration on top of the original collaboration. 
So in early 2021, Undercover uncovered their take on the Sakai LD waffle shoe to great fanfare, and in September 2021, John Paul Gaultier created his version of the Sakai vapor waffle. This collaboration really saw Sakai cemented as a streetwear staple for more than just those that care and know about underground brands, since which she became the queen of collaborations, continuing her affinity with collaborating with brands like Uggs, Porter, Gloverall, Apple, Dr. Wu, Pendleton, Coors, even Dior and Cartier. It's extremely rare for a brand to be able to do such high and low collaborations without diluting their brand. Even Versace has had issues with that in the past. But her brand aesthetic is so malleable in speaking to so many that it's transferable with price points. A very difficult thing for a brand to achieve. And really, it seems like her brand will only head upwards from here. Sakai has created a niche and a customer base for themselves that no other luxury label, except perhaps Comme de Garçon, has remotely tapped into. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe to see next week's video on who decides war, or check out previous videos like JW Anderson, Kid Super, or Vivian Westwood here.